I'm going to talk about some work I've done with Philip Brax, Adrienne Kuntz, uh, Scott Melville and David Benisti. Um, and I have an outline here. It, uh, here we go. So first of all, I'll tell you about the um, original motivation, the action, the approximations. I'm told I need to get that up front. Um, then I'm going to construct the effective action. And first, this is mainly going back to a paper with Phil in um, 2018, but a more diagrammatic approach was done with Adrian Kuntz. Um, I will look at solar system constraints and something kind of cute, the effect in the galactic center, which is work I did recently with a postdoc, David Benisti. But with Scott Melville, we realized that we can go beyond the approach we took here, where we had a sort of ladder of perturbative approach and go beyond that. So in doing so, we found a new screening mechanism, which I'll discuss. So, and then we go on to the conclusions. Well, why modify gravity? Um, the original motivation was that it could potentially explain dark energy. As we all know, the universe, the expansion of the universe is accelerating today. Why? Who knows? Um, despite best efforts over a large number of years, this is still at best an open question. But what it has done is opened up a different method of testing general relativity. It's a simple extension to GR, to the Einstein-Hilbert action. And it means that one can test now over a variety of different ranges that you would never have thought about without these models and constrain parameters or give hints of new physics and where to look. Um, so I'm going to consider the scalar tensor gravity with the standard kinetic terms and the most general coupling of the scalar field to matter. So it contains both a conformal coupling and disformal. And this really extends a program that was initiated by Damore and collaborators, where they were doing essentially a PN expansion of GR. So my action, we've got the Einstein metric, the Einstein-Hilbert term, scalar field, potential, and matter fields. And the scalar field couples to the matter field through the metric here. And when I say matter fields, this is whatever matters around, like the standard model particles, you and me. So this is the action for scalar tensor gravity. And the scalar field is coupled with the most general coupling due to Bekenstein. I think it goes back to 74. I didn't put the date in, which is stupid. So we've got a conformal term where A is some conformal factor. And this is the disformal term, B squared um, d mu phi d nu phi. And a is taken here to be e to the beta phi over m Planck and b as one over m to the four, where m is a scale factor in, in the, a new scale in the program. So I'm going to work consistently to leading order in the Newton constant at low velocities. And these two together would give you the um, PN expansion of general relativity. And including the conformal coupling and disformal coupling. So our Einstein equation, this is Einstein equation, but we've got the addition here of the energy momentum tensor of the scalar field. And this is given in the standard way. Um, T 
Timu nu phi is d mu phi d nu phi minus d square phi over two Einstein metric, which we have on the previous slide. And we've got the Klein-Gordon equation. It's now modified because, oh, uh, where are we going? I've lost, here we go. Because of the coupling of the scalar field through the metric to matter, the Klein-Gordon equation is modified to include the um, couple, uh, the matter, the trace of the engine momentum tensor of matter and T mu nu here. So this is the matter uh, engine momentum tensor. We now solve perturbatively. So this equation here, this is quite simple. We could solve it. This term, it's a bit more difficult. So what you do, you solve with the conformal term and add the um, this formal perturbatively. So the first term here, box del phi minus beta t over m Planck, easy. Del phi, bit harder. So let me expand this. Solution for that goes in there. Dot of phi is a series expansion. Dot of phi n, order by order. And this gives us the disformal coming in as a ladder expansion. So we can compute the first term. It gives you the, it it's, it's depends on the retarded green function. And this one we could do. Then the corrections, this formal term, again, the retarded green function and the engine momentum tensor coming in, derivatives, fun solution for that in there. Then to keep iterating, and this is the n plus one term. Nice. Um, so, the first iteration for moving body is this lot. Uh, little m is the mass of the body. Gamma is the relativistic gamma factor. And mu is dx mu by d tau. Um, here we can write this for small velocities or rewrite it for small velocities. X minus x primed is one plus delta delta expand as a function of velocity. And we've got the term for phi naught, the correction to phi naught coming in here in terms of v squared and v perp squared. V perp is v minus v dot n, n, where this is a, um, a normal. And we can now extend apply this to two bodies, any two bodies, two bodies moving, I should say, relative to each other. Sorry, and normal to what? Um, uh, the direction of motion, V dot N. Ah, okay, thank you. Um, so if we have two bodies, A and B, then the Klein-Gordon equation acquires the engine momentum tensor for particle A and body B. And so phi A would be, uh, phi would be that of the A field and the B field. Um, so this just generalizes what we had previously for A and B. Um, it's a separable solution. The X minus the position of the body. And this formally, the first correction, um, alpha and beta run over A and B. I've written down here, it's a function of the mass of the uh, body over the disformal coupling 
cap m to the fourth and the derivative terms are mu, u. When you compute this, you find that the term AA and BB are zero to leading order. The non-zero terms are the AB term. So this depends on the mass of the A particle, mass of the B particle, um, the conformal coupling, uh, as well as the disformal terms. And a bit of a mess, to be honest. Um, now, diagrammatically, since we're probably all particle physicists, um, the disformal comes in with this sort of ver this type of vertex. You could imagine a conformal coming in as two lines, one exchange of a phi particle. But here we've got the um, the d mu phi d nu phi vertex coming in here. And each time we've got a disformal insertion, it gives us this pressure factor of one over m to the four power, whatever m is, brings in the energy momentum tensor, and we just do that order by order. This allows us to construct an effective action for the two body. Um, the motion of a two body in modified gravity with conformal and disformal couplings, We've got both the gravitational sector and the um, scalar sector. The gravitational sector is just the Einstein Hilbert action. And you can write G mu nu as eta mu nu Minkowski background plus perturbation. So here's the action. And at low velocities to order in um, leading order and Newton constant, you can expand this term. Oh, GF stands for gauge fix, by the way. And for two bodies, and this is the expansion. I seem to be screwing my screen up here. It looks fine uh, here, I don't, uh, uh, you know, your slides are oh. visible. I'm hiding my. I'm hiding myself. Uh, yeah, I. The image of me is hiding the uh, stuff, so it's just gone. Um, so to second order in the velocity field, and leaving leading order in G, we've got the effects of particle A in the background of the field generated by B and vice versa for both sets of coupling. And so for particle A and B two bodies, we've got gravitational sector and the scalar sector. Now, I'm just writing it down because the derivation is kind of long. And I'll lose you. The thing to note, we've got the term, the correction term coming in at order beta squared. This is the conformal factor. And so that we would have had GN, MA, MB over xb minus xa. Now we've got this coming in as one plus two beta squared as a modification to gravity. Um, we've got other mess coming in down here. And somewhere or other here, we've got a term going as one over m to the four. So there's a modification coming from the conformal coupling and the disformal. And the disformal also depends on the conformal coupling. So this is a sort of action. And we can make it into an effective one body problem by going to the center of mass frame, introducing the reduced mass MA, MB over MA plus MB, the total mass, uh, total mass that, and the ratio of the reduced mass to the total mass squared, which is called nu. So the effect of Lagrangian 
is a bit easier. Um, reduce mass, V squared. Um, modifications coming in with conformal coupling and the modification with this formal coupling. And can, and I, can I jump in with a question here? Yeah. So, so we, in, in all your things, you've, you've emphasized that the disformal thing is always proportional to the conformal coupling uh, squared. So is, is there a reason for that? I mean, if, the, if what if I didn't have a conformal coupling? Would that mean that the for, this formal coupling wouldn't make any difference? Um, to this order, then it wouldn't make a difference. Um, I don't, th I don't completely understand that, um, but you seem to need both the, for, to get the effect of the disformal, you seem to need the conformal coupling in there. Huh. Um, now it's not, it, it, it might be that when you consider beyond this order, that's not the case. But this order in the PPN expansion, man. Yeah, yeah. And I realize there's a typo in my transparency. This should be capital M squared, not M Planck squared, lambda squared. I'm sorry about that. A slight change of notation going on. Um, what this effective Lagrangian is, is equivalent to having an effective metric. Um, ordinarily, in this expansion, you'd have the G0, zero, zero as um, one minus two GN um, total mass over X. Now it's modified to one plus two beta squared. And people who've worked on um, any modified gravity, this sort of changing what is essentially Newton's constant to be, to have a term plus two beta squared is fairly standard. Um, but here, the GIJ is coming in not just with, well, the Newton part, with conformal, and a disformal term coming in. Um, so it's like having, uh, changing your effective metric that the bodies are interacting with. Um, so when we consider the, um, we can, this will change the effect of light moving in the background of a heavier body, um, planet orbiting around the sun, or perhaps the um, stars that are orbiting around the, in the center of the galaxy. Um, the disformal coupling involves both perpendicular and parallel velocities, but the metric for photon in involves only parallel velocities. So we do get a violation of the equivalence principle between photons and matter. Um, it doesn't actually affect the Shapiro time delay, but it does affect the perihelium advance. And so we can compute that the usual way to do that is you use the um, Binet equation. So change the orbital variable from R to one over R. And we can write down the Binet equation for the, our system. Um, Sorry, this guy. Before you go too far into this, uh, you'd said in passing that, uh, that you don't get a, a change to the Shapiro Oh, delay. Oh, but this is the slide I wanted. Yeah. So, so here, no, no, could, could you go back to the slide you just showed? The one that shows GIJ? Yep. So, so if, if I'm looking at the, uh, basically the, the one over X term, that would be like the PPN, uh, the difference between the one over X term having a coefficient, you know, two GM uh, is like a contribution to the PPN parameter gamma. Yeah. And 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 that that normally I would have uh, that I'm thinking that that is what contributes to the the Shapiro delay. So so why is it that you don't get a, a contribution to the Shapiro delay from that? Um, to the leading order, um, the disformal doesn't doesn't affect that. Oh, the disformal one doesn't. Um, I see. I I, th I thought you were talking about both of them. Okay. Sorry, I'm sorry. I wasn't clear. 
The disformal doesn't affect it to leading order. Okay. The disformal, uh, the conformal does, and you've got the already got constraints on that coming in from things like Cassino, Cassini um, satellite. So um, we've we've already got constraints on beta, so we've got no new constraints coming in with the added uh, disformal. So, so then uh, just to, to completely shamelessly advertise something, we just posted something in the archive, which I think will allow you to get away with uh, the, you won't have to, you, you won't have to argue the beta is so small. <laughs> and so that you might be able to get a bigger effect uh, in the disformal piece too. Okay. I'll have a look. Being modest clip. But we won't be out till Friday. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Um, so if you want to look at the orbit, orbits of planets or orbits of a star in the center of the galaxy, then you go to the Binet equation and it's a bit of a mess, but here it is. Um, here we've got corrections coming in from the disformal coupling here and here. And from the conformal, it's um, a bit more standard. J would be the angular momentum conserved. So we can now look at the effect on the orbits of planets. Um, when we compute it, we can compute this in the way we would compute for the um, perihelium advance of, say, Mercury, in the way it was computed. It's just that now we've got extra terms coming in. But that's OK. Manageable. And the perihelium advance um, is for the um, planet, it's going over, um, P is the um, semi-major axis into one minus the eccentricity squared. Depends on the conformal coupling and disformal. Um, and if we assume that the scale here is M4 is greater than, um, we, can, we can get a constraint from the perihelium advance, which gives us that the mass here is greater or equal to 10 to the minus four MeV. Is there a question? Yes, there's a question about uh, what's uh, what's the the GR limit of your of your expressions. So, the GR limit, if you see from the effective um, Lagrangian, that beta goes to zero. and switch this term off. It should be, this should be cap M. Ah. So capital M goes to infinity. And you can see that if we go all the way back to near the beginning, you're essentially switching off um, the A and the B. So to switch B off, you would have to send M to infinity and beta goes to zero. So this just becomes one. And you, you recover then the, um, the metric that the particle, the standard model particles move in as the Einstein metric.
Um, so we can constrain the disformal coupling this way. Um, the in doing this, you don't you can't constrain the um, the you you have the conformal and the disformal. Um, so it's always a function of that, but you make the assumption about the conformal and then constrain disformal. Um, something that we can do that's pretty cool is to consider the stars orbiting the center of the galaxy. In the center of the galaxy, there's a supermassive black hole of mass of order 10 to the six uh, solar masses. And there are some stars in orbit around it. Um, these are called the S stars. And two of them are in some sort of eccentric orbit. So they, at one stage in their orbit, they come pretty close to the um, black hole. Obviously not that close, or else they, be, they wouldn't be there. Um, so you can look at the effect, the conformal and disformal coupling has on the orbit of the S stars. And this is a simulated data of the effect, in particular the disformal, um, having on the orbit of the S2 star, I think S2 star is about a solar mass. It's a fairly eccentric orbit. So at some stage, it comes quite um, closer and qu at quite high velocity around the black hole. Um, so the GR solution is in bl the blue. And we've got in the, um, the dotted um, this formal coupling and the dashed conformal coupling in there. So there's quite a sort of um, procession around the black hole. Cap capital Lambda is um, what you called uh, Capital Lambda for? Capital Lambda, I'm afraid, in this transparency is capital M. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how to mask it. Yeah. My... My LaTeX abilities are not that great. Um, so we looked at two stars, the S2 and the S38. I think that's all they've really got data for, but I'm not 100% sure of that. It's not my strong point. Um, so here we've got um, these stars orbiting um, the galaxy, um, the black hole. Um, Sagittarius A star. Um, this is the data for S2. We're both, um, it's actual data, and we've got our, our predictions coming in for GR and for our conformal and disformal couplings. Um, there's much less data on S38, but we've got it there anyway. And this sort of puts another constraint on the parameters. Um, it's a fairly weak constraint, but at least, you know, but if one observes these stars for long enough, then the constraints will only get better. Um, we used Monte Carlo um, Markov chains and got that beta squared was around 10 to the minus three. Um, the Cassini satellite has beta squared as 10 to the minus 5. That's observing the radio waves coming from Saturn, where poor old Cassini was based, um, deflecting around the sun to us. And for the capital M, it was 2 MeV. So they're not that strong, but it gives you a very different application of looking at these effects in these strong gravity regime at the galactic center. Now, 
in order to do this, in order to extract it, I've done very much a perturbative expansion. The disformal coupling has been added in order by order. And we can actually do better than that. If we're clever, we can resum this and get a more non-perturbative effect. And in doing so, in the case of two bodies, we get a, a new screening mechanism. So this is work done with Scott Melville. Um, so here's what I've done so far. I've got the conformal term and written down phi is the conformal plus delta phi. Um, delta phi is treated perturbatively as a sum over the corrections for coming from the disformal term. So first order, I would get the first order correction to the disformal coupling. So here's a conformal coupling. That would give phi zero. Um, come back. Phi one, include a disformal term. Phi two, two disformal terms, et cetera, et cetera, for two bodies, body one and body two. Well, that's fine. We can construct the corrections, but it'll only break down when the first order correction is the same order as the leading term. And this happens when the mass times the velocity squared over the M4, the conformal factor, R cube, uh, uh, this, this parameter. And in that case, the first term, first correction, is the same order as the zeroth term. Um, so corrections come when the distance parameter, R cubed, that we're considering, goes as mv, mv squared over cap m to the four. And I can call this the Weinstein radius, R cubed, V squared. Um, it's not, it's just, it's just, uh, this is introducing R V is a way of um, connecting with parameters and not having to rewrite this the whole time, rather than saying this is the Weinstein radius. It's equivalent, but it's not, I'm not really getting Weinstein screening. If I define the ladder parameter as V squared of cubed over the orbit, little r cubed, then my perturbative expansion is good when L is much less than one. This is low velocity and large distances. And if this is much bigger than one, then the ladder approximation will break down. The correction terms are the same order as the first term or perhaps higher. And we need to do something else. What we need to do is to resum the disformal terms. And this parameter L is very important as it marks the change from the perturbative regime to the regime where we have to resum. Now, if I were to hope that the disformal term was order the um, dark energy scale, so M squared would be of order M Planck times the Hubble constant today, then around the um, RV is around 10 to the eight angstroms around the sun or 10 to the six angstroms around the earth. So for an earth-like body, L 
the ladder parameter, much less than one, gives velocities of order 10 to the minus 21, less than 20 to the minus 21, which is kind of tiny. So we do have to be careful here that to include the disformal terms, we actually need to consider going beyond the simple expansion that we've done so far. Um, so that's happening because uh, that's a super, super small value for capital M, right? That's like an electron volt or less. That's right, yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if M is um, much bigger, then you'll get a, you know, it's higher velocity, but even so, it doesn't take much for a wrong way um, to think that the um, the first correction, which is written down here, becomes of the order of the leading term. I mean, obviously, if M is um, big, uh, what would big be? I mean, if M is if M is quite big, then then okay, fine. I'm not sure exactly how big, but yeah. If if you want this as dark energy, then you know you really need to resum. When you say that dark energy, you mean the you're thinking the scalar field is uh, if that had been a if that, if that had, had been some quintessence field or something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um. As a rough rule of thumb, for gravitationally bound binary systems, the ladder for dark energy breaks down whenever the orbital size um, in Hubble units becomes comparable to the orbital size in Schwarzschild radii, approximately. Um, so, but formally, we can actually resum this. All I was doing was expanding the um, corrections due to the disformal delta phi as a power series expansion. And it was an operator equation, and I think I've written it down here. So um, the first correction was including, um, I had that it was a sum over terms with the, um, the first correction depending on the zero term, the second correction depending on the first order term. So you're doing it recursively using the preceding term to compute the next term. So the nth term is dependent on the n minus one term with the operator d1. For two bodies, so phi one and phi two. So this then would be equal to the um, operator D two on phi one M minus two, hit with D one, operator one. And the operator is the, I'm now keeping track of the disformal terms so that if I were to write my disformal correction rather than one over m4 as d over m4. So d is keeping track of whenever I've got disformal. It's the um, r cubed of particle a and um, over ra and derivative of the function. And this is coming from the, um, the metric. So this gives me a very formal equation that each term I can get by just reconstructing with operators n times. But this is a sum here formally that we can resum. So, so this is kind of looks sounds a lot like the latter approximation in atoms, and so. Uh... One of the questions that arises there is, is it a prescription or is it a systematic expansion in powers of a small thing? And so, so can you phrase this resummation as, uh, you know, working to all orders in 
you know, you know for example, if you had been doing a, a, a large logarithm approximation, you'd worked uh, all orders in alpha times a log, but you'd drop terms that are order alpha squared times a log. So you, you know it's controlled by alpha. Is there a way you can phrase this as a systematic expansion in some small parameter? Um, I don't actually know. It might be, it's the kind of thing that might be possible because that's the kind of thing that uh, in the end of the day, if you could solve the classical equations, they would be there to all orders in L. So it makes sense that, uh, it, you know, there, there could exist a parameter, but it, and then it'll be L times something. So, so the thing that's becoming order one is something like, uh, it was like R cubed over, uh, over R, you know, it was rv cubed over r cubed times v squared or something and so maybe you're working to all orders and that I th I th but you're dropping powers of l or something i think that's right yes huh. be worth pinning that down because that kind of uh it, it's, it's always kind of dangerous to read some things so that having control over the whether or not you know for, for example if you'd had phi two in the, in your square bracket you know why isn't that why is that small <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we can resum this formally. So it's just a one over one minus um, d one d two on this. Um, which is essentially. is our perturbative we're summing them all up so we're summing over um over n 2n with that means 2n disformal um things and 2n plus one so each time we've got disformal vertices and, but the resummation is giving you know the two bodies minus this guy d d disformal disformal acting on the two bodies with the conformal uh, one conformal and one disformal that's what that is so diagrammatically we can consider this in this form and now, the field profile abides this differential equation. And for the two body problem, we can take the um, first term in the ladder expansion to use as the source to compute the full, uh, full non-perturbative result. It's very formal, but um, to compute this, we again use the retarded green function. Um, each of these functions depend on the world line, tau of x. So the equation is actually a functional differential equation. Um, using retarded green's function, I mean, it's a complete mess, but we can do it. The details are in the paper and I put the reference down um, and I'm not going to go through them because they take too long. Um, but we can then solve in two regimes. When the R cubed is much bigger than V squared, um, RV cubed, the disformal effects are small, we solve perturbatively. And that we've already done, we can go back to this equation and check that we can pull out the results I had previously um, at the start. In the opposite regime, the disformal effects dominate. The first term here is small. And the differential equation um, becomes an 
ODE for Forda, but it gives the um, scalar field experienced um, by particle two due to particle one. And here it is. So this is the Spruchar radius of particle one and the Weinstein comes out to be um, beta over this formal h squared tau squared, that's Hubble constant. Um, from this, we can extract the effects on the Newtonian orbits of the binaries. Um, so again, the perturbative regime has already been done, but in the um, other regime, the, the, this regime here, there's something very cute going on. Um, apply this to elliptical orbits, um, semi asia matrix A, eccentricity E. Um, then the ladder parameter depends on the eccentricity. I've just written it down in slightly different form. And from this, we can compute the um, correction to the fifth force from this um, resummation. The correction to the conformal fifth force depends on the disform disformal coupling on the Weinstein uh, and on these radii here plus beta squared. And the disformal fifth force, again, this coupling and these factors. And when we compute these factors, they are all um, go back. When we compute these factors in the resolution regime, it gives you this nasty. I think I said something wrong there. In the ladder regime, these are the corrections. And this is what we had before. In the resummation regime, the corrections to the conformal fifth force and the disformal fifth force are depend on these parameters. Um, rho is R over the semi-major axis. And the in the resummation regime, both the conformal and disformal um, fifth force is suppressed by R S R cubed V. And this is the regime where this is actually suppressed by one, this is actually one over L, this is L here. So the correction to the conformal fifth force and this formal fifth force is going as one over L in the regime where L is very large. So for two bodies, this resummation of the ladder approximation, of the ladder expansion is giving us is actually screening the fifth force when we resum. It's coming for two bodies. We're only resumming the disformal correction for two bodies. So this is not a screening that's um, already in the literature because it's, it, it, um, it's, strictly, speak, it's strictly a two body screening. Um, Essentially, we've been doing two things. We've got a ladder expansion, PN expansion, with the conformal, disformal couplings. Um, when the ladder becomes order one, we go to the resummation regime. And I haven't talked about circular orbits, and I don't think I'm going to have time. Um, for the planets, um, if the 
parameters of order one in the resummation regime, um, you've got both the fifth force, which is screened by many orders of magnitude, and this is giving the eccentricity against this um, radii for the different planets. Um, the outermost planets, um, the screening factor is um, less effective, that's because of their distances greater than for the innermost planets. Um, we can look at the precession of the planets due to ladder screening. And here we've got the, um, the planets lining up, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Um, Pluto is no longer a planet and there's not enough data. So the, this is the GR value of the precession. Um, and here we're including um, formal and disformal couplings in the ladder approximation. This allows us to look at constraints on parameters coming from the precession of the planets. Um, the current constraint coming from Mercury is up here in the parameter of the disformal coupling M and the conformal coupling, which I called beta squared previously. And the a new um, mission, the Bepi Columba, will give us constraints down here. Interestingly, we have a lot of data now from Cassini for Saturn, and this gives us our constraints here. So the, um, is there a query? Can you see the question? Yep. So while you're looking for your slide, uh, I'll just read it for the uh, so people that are just listening. Uh, the question is, I don't fully understand where the screening came from. Uh, is it because the second term has negative terms in the expansion? No. So we're dealing here with a highly nonlinear system. And it's a bit like, um, it's, it's not the same, but it's similar to um, the Weinstein mechanism where you got the nonlinear terms in a Lagrangian coming in to screen the leading term for um, inside some radius. Here we've got, the complete nonlinearities that we are able to resum. And we're finding that because the terms are, um, we had to resum because the non leading terms were as big as the leading terms, but resummation is giving us the fact that they are um, that. Um, they're becoming so nonlinear that they're actually screening the effect of what is what would have been the leading term um, fifth force. I don't know if I've really answered your question, but it's a sort of it's coming from the whole nonlinearities of the disformal coupling that you're getting the um, the screening effect coming in. So where was I? Is there another query? 
Oh, he's just saying that he thanks you for yeah. answering it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this allows us to um, realize that the screening has a very big effect. And what it's doing it is actually, whereas before we thought that we were getting, you know, interesting effects from um, this, we're actually screening the fifth force in certain regions. Um, so I'm going to go on to my last transparency, you'll be pleased to know. And what we've done is we've looked at the um, effects of modified gravity on the dynamics of a two body system. We've done this using a, an effective um, field theory approach, which has um, initially doing the um, what is essentially a PN expansion, but including the um, effect of modified gravity as well. Um, and we've used the um, our results to show to constrain the parameters in the solar system constraints. And I think this must be a first of looking at modified gravity in the galactic center. Um, and then show this rather novel result that you can go through the ladder expansion and show that it can be resummed depending on this ladder parameter L. Um, when L is big, you've got to resum it because the non-leading terms are big. And in resumming, the non-linearities kick in and you recover this new screening mechanism operative in the two-body case. Um, now, the obvious thing that one can do is to look at this with spinning particles. So one can include a Kerr matrix, apply this to dynamics of black holes and neutron stars. And I haven't talked about it, but with Philip Brax, Scott Melville and Kim Wong, there's two papers on the archive where we're looking at Kerr black holes and uh, spinning black holes. Sorry, spinning particles, I should say. And what you can do with conformal and disformal coupling. So thank you. I'll stop there. <laughs>